You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey, queens. Hey. Hey, girls. So, <laughs> long-time listeners of the show know that we usually do a summer break. That's right. Burnout is real, even when it's something you love. I like know. Yeah, yeah, you need a break. We didn't want to leave you guys high and dry for all of this. Exactly. Over the summer, we're going to be featuring a few different things. Yeah, you might have heard a couple of our classic Patreon episodes. We'll put them on the feed. Yeah, that's right. And our Patreon episodes might be a little bit different, like the formatting might be a little bit different, but we think you're going to love them. Right. You you might have also heard an episode from another podcast that we might yeah. recommend. We have a couple of shows we're going to feature on the feed that we think you'll love while we take a little break. We hope you enjoy the show. And let's raise a glass. And as always... Y'all, we curse a little bit. (laughs) So if you don't like strong language in your history, this may not be the show for you. No, Nathan's got a potty mouth, (laughs) dude. Cheers, bitches. Hello to my beautiful queens, and welcome back to another weekend here in my corner. I have to know how many of you guys watched Becoming Elizabeth. And I want to know what you guys thought about it. I was lucky enough to do a little, um, a little co-host. I don't know what you would call it. A friend of mine does the recaps for Becoming Elizabeth over on the Tudor Dynasty podcast. And she got COVID. And so she wrote her review and I read it for her. And it was a lot of fun. And it was a lot of fun to discuss it. But, and my thoughts on the show were that it was... It was fine. Also, I don't need a billion percent historical accuracy in these stars dramas. I don't go to stars for my source material of research. If it was 100% accurate, it might be boring. It might be confusing. It might not be something easily digestible or that you'd want to watch. But one character that did have me going, hmm, I want to learn more about her, was Amy Robsart. Or she's also known as Amy Dudley. And I feel like not a lot is discussed about her life. We hear a lot about the death of Amy Dudley. So, obviously, I went down a rabbit hole. And I thought you would like to come down it with me. So, one thing that I find really interesting about Amy Dudley. Like I said, there's a lot documented about her death but not a whole lot about her life. And when we think of the casualties of the Tudor court, we think Thomas More, Anne Boleyn, people who were publicly executed and their strife and their convictions were put on display for the entire country. I think, in my opinion, Amy Dudley is also a victim of this cutthroat court that I don't think she ever really asked to be part of. So she is also a victim of the Tudor dynasty, but she's not talked about in the same way because it's shrouded in mystery and because she wasn't tried unfairly or anything, her life just took a turn that I don't think she ever expected. So that being said, let's get into her. There's not, I just can't drive this home enough. There is so much out there about her death but there's not a whole lot about her life and her family. So I did have to rely pretty heavily on Yield Wikipedia for this one. So Amy was born June 7th, 1532. So I love that we actually know her birthday and that she was a Gemini. I know, I know. You might be thinking, okay, we can't actually know anything about her personality based on her birthday. And to that, I say, are you an Earth sign? You're giving me Capricorn vibes, maybe Taurus. Because that's a very earth sign thing of you to say. And it's my podcast, so if I want to muse about her personality based on her astrological sign, my guess is as good as anyone else's. Because we don't have a lot of diaries or correspondence. We have some correspondence that survive, but not a lot that really tell us a lot about her character. Isn't that remarkable that we know her date of birth? When there are so many women in history who are like children of literal kings, and we have no idea the day of their birth. But this girl, who was never going to be a king or a queen or whatever, we know her birthday, June 7th, 1531. 
So to put it in context with some other players, um, she's actually less than a year old than Elizabeth the first. So she would have been born during the whole like breaking from the church, the Catherine of Aragon annulment. But I think she would have been too young to really remember a whole lot of um, the beheadings of it all. So Amy was born in Norfolk, which is about two hour drive from northeast, two hour drive northeast of London. Like it was, it was close enough to like go to court for a day kind of thing. Her father, John Robsart, was a gentleman farmer. And so I was like, okay, what the fuck does that mean? What is a gentleman farmer? Basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. He was of the upper class, but he was also a farmer. This was often the case for like younger sons of younger sons of younger sons of people with titles. Like I couldn't really find her exact family tree, but let's say your grandfather is a duke and his third son is your dad. And you're like the third son of that dad. Like, you're still in the aristocracy, your blood is still blue, but you're not so well connected that you're going to easily get a role, like, in the king's council or as a courtier, necessarily. So you've got several options for, like, an occupation. You have to actually get an occupation. Soldier is a good one here. But also, there were a lot of people that would be like, I'm going to run a farm on my lands and you know, manage the farm and hire people and sell the goods from the farm and bada bing, bada boom, you got gentleman farmer. Amy's family was Protestant, which was lucky for them because the Protestant Reformation was happening all around them. So being that both of her parents were already raised Protestant, she grew up in a house that was actually inherited by her mother, whose name was Elizabeth Scott. It was called Stanfield Hall in a town called Women damn. Mm, not, definitely not saying that right. Women damn. Women damn. Mm. Anyway, but it was a market town, which meant that it was really easy for them to then take the stuff that they made at their farm and go sell it in the market. So, and business seemed to be booming because Amy grew up very comfortable. Anyway, so I go- Googled Stanfield Hall, and the first thing that comes up is a story called Murders at Stanfield Hall. And it's not about Amy. It's something that happened in, like, the mid-1800s. So I'm going to need to revisit that shit later. Like, I didn't take the time to dig into that right now. But, yeah, that is where she grew up. And then, like, 200, 300 years later, there were some murders. (laughs) I can't find a whole, whole lot about her family, except that it was her mom's second marriage. And she definitely had half-siblings from her mom's first marriage. So I'm going to take an educated guess that she is either the youngest child. No, I think, yeah, she is the youngest child. So any of us older children, like I'm the oldest, I know what that means is that she probably got away with a lot more shit than her older brothers and sisters. Yeah. So like I said, it's kind of hard to find a lot of information about her family tree. So I ended up on a website called WikiTree um, where it's like, Wikipedia, but for people that want to go in and build out their family trees. So this is where I got a lot of the next bit of information. So grain of salt, people. Take it all with a grain of salt. So her mother was first married to a guy whose last name was Appleyard, which I love. Like, it's very descriptive. Like, you know what people were looking at when they chose that last name. Amy's mom was born around 1504, but we don't know when she married Appleyard. And they had four children in the span of like five or six years. So fertile myrtle over here. Appleyard dies in 1528. So Amy's mom would have only been about 24-ish. So she's got her whole life ahead of her. Now we don't know when she married Amy's dad exactly, but Amy isn't born for like another four or five years after Appleyard dies. So I guess Amy's mom had like time to like grieve, recover, wasn't just like immediately forced into another marriage, which is nice. However, John Ropsart, her next husband, has an acknowledged illegitimate child named Arthur. And then the two get married and they only have one child together, our girl Amy. And if no one finds any of this interesting as I did, I'm so sorry. But I'm like, okay, mama was fertile myrtle and they didn't have birth control back then. So it's stuff like this that I just wish I knew. Like, did something happen when giving birth to Amy to make it where she couldn't have any kids after that? Because she's only 
like she's not even 30 yet. You know, women had children much later. You know, there wasn't birth control. Or did something happen with dad? Or did mom and dad not really, weren't really into each other that way? You know, I'm a nosy bitch. I just want to know why she's an only child from that marriage. Anyway, Amy had a really good education for her rank in society. Remember, we've discussed times that this time period just seemed like a really fashionable time to educate your girls as well as your boys. So Amy could read and write, probably fucked around with some languages, probably knew like theology, probably like a little bit of like astronomy and like musical instruments and shit like that. Okay. So Amy grew up on a farm, an aristocratic farm, but still a farm. So her father, her parents had a high enough standing and they were close enough to London that I'm sure they went to court from time to time, like special occasions. But relatively speaking, she wasn't like all that well connected. And so she probably wasn't going to court all that much. So how did she end up married to Robert Dudley? At the time of their marriage in 1550, John Dudley was the de facto ruler of England. I can't find that he was actually ever given the title of Lord Protector, but he was acting as regent basically for the underage Edward VI of England, who was a child. Babies don't need jobs. At the time, John Dudley held the title of Earl of Warwick, though in his lifetime he would go on to get many other titles. Obviously, this sent me down like this whole other rabbit hole of, okay, Is he, like, what's his relation to Richard Neville, a.k.a. Wardick, a.k.a. the Kingmaker, who was also the Earl of Warwick? And from just, like, the basic skimming I got to do, because I didn't want to spend too much time on this, it doesn't seem like there was any relation. It looks like the King just wanted to give John Dudley a title and no one was using Earl of Warwick. So, uh, bada bing, bada boom. Warwick. Um, What a... A lot of bada bing, bada booming in this. I don't, I don't know what that's all about. Sorry, y'all. And also maybe they were related in a way that like everyone at court was related. But he didn't, he didn't get this title due to inheritance or anything. Anyway, in 1549, there was a rebellion called Ketz Rebellion in Norfolk. Um, and this was touched on a bit in uh, Becoming Elizabeth's show. And if you guys want a full episode on that, I'm sure I could dive into it. It was like some, some peasants being pissed off as as rebellions usually go. And so John Dudley, the Warwick, uh, Earl of Warwick, comes out to Norfolk to see what the problem is. And it looks like Amy's mother was sister-in-law to this Ket guy who the rebellion was named for. I could be getting that slightly wrong, but her mom was somehow related by marriage to the guy that was like aiding and abetting a rebellion in Norfolk. So in an effort to seem like super compliant and super in support of the royal family or whatever, it seems that Rosbart House was like overcompensating. Like, oh my gosh, we are, our only purpose in life is to help you squash this rebellion, whatever you want. And John Dudley had brought his son Robert to fight the battle and squash Ket's rebellion with him when he went to Norfolk. And it seems that around this time, when the 17-year-old Amy met the 17-year-old Robert Dudley, it was fireworks. Fun fact, his birthday is two weeks after hers. Same year and everything. That makes him like a cancer, more on the cancer Gemini cusp, just FYI. So Now, we have no idea what went down here. But just about everyone assumes that, yeah, it was a love match. They were getting married because they wanted to bone. Because on paper, this doesn't seem like something that most, the most powerful man in the country would have chosen for his son. But remember, Amy is her father's only legitimate child. So she's an heiress. Plus, Robert is his father's fourth living son. So he's probably like, I don't have any more titles for you to inherit. I don't got any more land for you to inherit. You found a wife that is going to have an inheritance, this is fine. Also, it seems like her parents were eager to be on Dudley's side, and they were really influential in Norfolk. And there had been an uprising in Norfolk, so it was good PR for both sides. Okay, real quick, I do want to talk about how Robert falling in love and wanting to marry Amy helped him dodge a bullet. So they were married in 1550. 
three years later, John Dudley married his fifth son to a little royal girl you might know, Jane Grey. Yes, that Jane Grey, hashtag poor baby Jane. And things do not go great for Robert's brother or Jane Grey. So I have to wonder if Robert hadn't already been married, would John have been like, okay, Robert, you're marrying Jane Grey. And how would the story be different now? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Because in 1550, Amy and Robert Dudley were married. And by all accounts, they were very much in love. While it wasn't like this huge over the top wedding, it did take place in a royal residence. And it had an impressive guest list, including King Edward VI, and his sister, the Princess Elizabeth. Now, have any of y'all seen the Elizabeth, the, the movie about Elizabeth with Kate Blanchett? Elizabeth finds out that Robert Dudley is already married and she throws a huge fit and kicks him out. In real life, she would have been like, you're already married. And he would have been like, LOL, bitch, you were at the wedding. You know, what are you talking about? Well, I haven't read anything that spells this out plainly. I think, yeah, they were pretty eager to fuck on their wedding day. And it was evident to anyone with eyes. Or maybe they'd already fucked. That probably happened a lot more commonly than people know, because it seemed like the engagement was very, very short, and the couple was affectionate at their wedding. William Cecil, who would later go on to be Elizabeth the first most valued advisor, called the wedding a carnal marriage, and was supposedly so grossed out by how affectionate they were to each other. I mean, they're two almost 18-year-olds. They're horny as fuck, you know? And I'm just, okay, Cecil, you sound fine at parties. Let me make sure to invite you to a bunch of parties. Ugh, who invited this fucking guy anyway? Now, the couple didn't have their own house, but they were certainly not homeless. They'd stay with Robert's parents or they'd stay at court. It seems like in the early years, Amy was with her husband the, the usual amount for wives of high-level courtiers. She seems to have lived at court with him when he was there, and they were seen together at most co-ed type of events. I do have to wonder what was going on here, since the two didn't have any children, and it was a love match. And though Robert didn't later go on, he did go on to have, like, one or two babies. Not babies on babies on babies on babies, but he did have, like, one or two kids. I, you know, who knows? Maybe one or both of them had health issues, maybe on purpose trying to avoid conception for whatever reason. I'll just never know. But once again, I am a nosy bitch and I wish wish I knew. Huh. Absolute side note. And the topic that I'm starting to research for the main feed episode coming back soon. There was a couple where the man, King Henry I, had like 20 children. Like that is not an exaggeration. He had 20 children. And his second wife and him were together for 15 years. And they tried and tried and tried to conceive. And they never did. And then after Henry died, his second wife married at age 35, probably assuming, oh, well, I'm just, children aren't in the cards for me. And they had seven children, like back to back to back, like seven children in less than 10 years or something crazy like that. So maybe sometimes people's ingredients just don't mix. Anyway, everything seemed to be going just fine for our couple until in 1553, Edward VI dies. And that is when the shit hits the Band. I'll not go into full detail because in our one, in our Lady Jane Grey episode, we do that. But the TLDR is that Edward dies. Dudley's younger son, who's married to Lady Jane Grey, and Edward had named Lady Jane Grey as his successor in his will. So Dudley was like, okay, we're naming Jane Grey queen, making my son married to the king, he or to the queen. I guess he's like now king consort. He got a title of some kind of duke or something. But then Mary Tudor, aka the daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, came in and she was like, lol, nope. Hard nope. And now everyone is in prison in the Tower of London. All the Dudleys. All the Dudley men. Lady Jane Grey, Princess Elizabeth, all in the Tower. But not Amy, which I found interesting. I think her lower birth and her lack of real connections besides her husband really saved her. Like, what what the fuck is she gonna do? You know? And this also leads me to believe that she, I don't think she was particularly interested in politics. I can't place where Amy was at the time. So I'm going to assume that when her husband was arrested, she fled back to Norfolk or she was already there when everything went down. Um, I have to imagine that she was freaking the fuck out and probably freaking out even further when in May 1553, her husband father-in-law and brother-in-law were all sentenced to death. Two of her brother-in-laws sentenced to death. 
Um, I did read that she was allowed to visit him in the tower. It said she was allowed to tarry. So I don't, I don't know what that fucking means. I Googled meaning of tarry and it said something like of or related to tar. And I don't think that, I don't think that's right. I think it means that she was able to visit and like take her time. You know, like no one was rushing her out. She didn't have short visits. She was allowed to chill for a bit. But please let me know if I got that wrong. Because regardless, can you imagine the anxiety? Your husband, who you love, has been sentenced to death and is in the tower. Like, ugh. Though I have to wonder how serious Robert's condemnation was. Because he... uh, his younger brother, his dad, and his sister and his sister-in-law, Lady Jane Grey, they were all executed. But Robert was never given like a date to be executed. They were just sort of like, I feel like almost it was like they were keeping him and his other brother in the tower just as like, we don't really have a good case to execute you, but we also don't fucking trust you. You know what I mean? His eventual release and pardon seemed to have been a lot in thanks to his mother, who called in every favor. And she was like a longtime courtier. So she knew everybody and she pled with her friends and she petitioned the queen night and day. Like my son, Robert didn't do anything. He's not guilty by association, just doing whatever she could to try to save him, which is like, I love this. I love this look because I feel like there are a lot of martyrs in the Tudor court of people who get executed, like Thomas More and ask you all these people that are just like, like, I am dying for my faith. I'm a martyr. Whereas uh, the Dudley mom, she was like, you know what? Uh, Robert told me he wants some prayer beads up in there and he wants to take mass. So yeah, I think he'll convert if you let him out. He's, he's begging to take mass. If he was begging to take mass, we have no idea. Probably not. He was raised Protestant. He probably didn't, like, I wouldn't know I wasn't raised Catholic, so I don't know what you do with the uh, with rosary, really. So he's probably like that, like, so will save my life, yeah. And me the beads, please. Love the Pope. Cannot get enough of that guy if it'll save my life, you know? Yeah, it's just refreshing to me to see somebody as cowardly as myself being represented. Either way, Robert was released, and it seems like this is when their marriage took a turn. Robert was had amassed a load of debt, which I don't really understand. I feel like there's something I'm missing that I don't understand about being in prison in the 16th century. Because I'm like, how did he how did he amass a bunch of debt if he'd just been like chilling in prison? So I don't know. Did they like after you get out of prison, do you get a bill? for your room and board. Was that how it worked back then? They went back to Norfolk. You know, his family is, they're not going to be able to provide any money to them right now. Their family connections aren't getting them opportunities like it used to. They're traitors. They're, yeah. So they go back to Norfolk. I just feel like now he is completely relying on his wife's family for everything. And he's having some fragile dick energy about it. I don't have anything to back that up. That's just the vibe I'm getting is that he's starting to resent her for being kind of his meal ticket and probably not even that that great of a meal ticket. All right. So over the next five years, both of Amy's parents die, which I, most only children are pretty close to their parents. So I have to imagine that fucking sucked. But as like a consolation... Um, they inherit all of their lands and they've got a little nest egg now, which was a relief because it wasn't enough. Like it was a relief for them to have that, but it wasn't enough. And Robert was like, I'm never going to make as much money as I was when I was able to work at court, being a courtier and being like in the inner circle of, you know, basking in the glow of the crown. So I think Robert is like, how do I get back in the good graces of Mary, the Queen Mary and her husband? And so he goes off to fight in one of the wars. And from this time, letters survive like after he leaves to go to one of the one of the wars or whatever. Letters survive of Amy writing to settle some of Robert's debts. And in them, she's like making excuses for him, being like, sorry, he was so preoccupied with going off to fight this war. And I was preoccupied worrying about him that I guess this bill just went unnoticed. Super sorry. Let me pay it off. Which gives me very much like she's making excuses for him. Like it just, 
it just, I, I don't have a whole lot of hardcore evidence, but I just get the vibe that something was off in their marriage at this point before it was rumored that she, he was the lover of a queen. Spoiler alert. So the next year, Robert returns and the two seem happy. Again, no letters, no diaries or anything like that survived to tell us. But we do know that right after he returns, they're like, okay, we want a new, we want a new house, new, fresh starts. We, you're back from war. You survived. This is going to be a new turning point from us. Let's start fresh. And they start shopping around for somewhere new to live. They're going to like rent out her parents' house and get something of their own. But then Queen Mary dies and Elizabeth Tudor is now queen. And I'm not really sure if Amy knew how close her husband and the Princess Elizabeth, now Queen Elizabeth, had been. I'm sure she knew they were friendly, but I don't think anybody really knew. I don't know when the feelings started percolating between uh, Elizabeth and Robert. So whenever Elizabeth becomes Queen Elizabeth, she immediately was like, I need Robert Dudley to be my master of horse. And I don't think Amy thought too much of it. She was probably like, oh, this will be good for us. This is going to, he wanted to get back at court. This is going to make him happy. This is going to make him feel not emasculated anymore. He's going to have a job. This is going to be so good for us. And this is a really, really prestigious role as well. She didn't really go to court with him though. And he was at court all the time. Like, reports are, Elizabeth was like, you were to, like, basically never be out of my line of vision. I need you here with me all the time. And that's when the rumors started, probably unsurprisingly. And then it was just like anyone with eyes could see that the two of them were in love. Or at least that the queen was in love with Amy's husband. And he was given living quarters with direct access to the queen's room. So, yeah, people are talking. And Amy just didn't go to court with her husband anymore. However, this may also have been due to ill health. People that know more about this stuff than I do believe that Amy may have had breast cancer. And I shudder to even think about what the treatment for breast cancer was back then. But either way, even if she was sick, she didn't exactly have a husband who was there to support her and take care of her. Because over the next year, she saw her husband, like, twice. I think at one point, she did go stay at court for about a month. But after that, I mean, that was it. Can you imagine that month at court? And just, you know, every time you leave a room, people are talking shit on you. You know that the gossip is that your husband is sleeping with his boss. But his boss is also your boss. Because she is the queen of the whole fucking country. Like, do you know that feeling whenever you've walked into a room and you feel like people were just talking about you? But could you imagine that for a whole month? And just like anytime someone's looking at you, they're looking at you with pity. I, I just, my stomach hurts thinking about the level of anxiety that that would have caused me. Knowing that every time you leave a room, people are like, oh, that poor woman, she's sick and her husband's sleeping with the queen. You know, I just hate this for her. It gives me the ick. I, oof. On top of all that, there are also whispers that they know, everyone knows that she's sick. So it's like, well, it's only a matter of time that she dies and Robert marries Elizabeth. Ew. 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 I don't envy this woman at all, at all in this stage in her life. So I can't blame her for maybe not wanting to spend a whole lot of time at court. But then was her life lonely without her husband? Her parents were dead. She didn't have any children, and I can't really tell that she was particularly close to any of her half-siblings. I couldn't even tell if she was, like, raised with her half-siblings. I I don't know. Amy left court in May 1559 after that month-long stay, and that was the last time she saw her husband. Not the last time she talked to him. He did write letters, but that was the last time she saw him. And Amy moved into a a place called Cumnor Hall. This may have been arranged for Amy by Robert. He had just gotten his promotion, at, like even higher than Master of the Horse. It came with a big pay raise. And it came with rooms at Windsor, Windsor Palace. So it was going to be pretty easy 
Cumnor Hall and Windsor Palace weren't far from each other by those standards. So it'd be easy for him to be doing court shit at Windsor, ride to Cumnor to see his wife for a few hours, and then ride back before, like, nightfall or whatever. So Amy wasn't completely alone at Cumnor Hall, which I love. She had a couple of ladies in waiting. She had about 10 people on her staff. And Cumnor Hall was meant to be temporary living for her. And it was like this big palace, but the living quarters were all broken up. So in my mind, I'm imagining like ye old condos. Like she basically had a fancy fucking condo. Next to her, she, there was like a middle-aged woman who was a widow that lived next to her. And they were friendly. So I love that. And it seems like she was friendly with her staff and stuff. I'm sure she'd much rather be with her husband than her next door neighbor and her staff. But still, she didn't live in complete solitude, which I like. And though she didn't see Robert, he did send her gifts and money. And he was actually like, gave her this big allowance to decorate Cumnor Hall. He was like, if somebody stops by unexpectedly, I am one of the most powerful courtiers in England. And my wife isn't living in a beautifully decorated place. It's going to look bad. So here, get new furniture. Redo the, the, decorate, pimp my hall. Pimp out Cumnor Hall. Just do it. So I do kind of like that she had a project, something for her to do, but I just get the vibe that she was depressed. Can you blame her? Also, I don't know. I don't know a whole, I don't know a whole lot about symptoms of cancers, but I have to imagine when your body isn't thriving, your, it might send you into a depression. Your brain might also not be thriving in a happy place either, especially when you don't have love and support. So I just get in my mind that she was, she was sad. Um, word on the street was that Elizabeth was also fiercely, fiercely jealous of Amy. She didn't let him visit his wife. And when he did, you know, obviously not after this month long stay, but I guess previously, when he did visit her, she made Robert swear that he wasn't sleeping with his wife. Like, uh... you know what? I don't want to speak ill of anybody, but like, I get the vibe. I can see that Elizabeth I being a very jealous person because Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, her parents were both, you know, hotheads getting jealous all the time. So to me, it tracks. Now, let's get to the bummer shit. Um, September 8th, 1560, after, like, we haven't already been in the bummer shit, but further in, diving into the bummer shit. September 8th, 1560, after breakfast, Amy suggested to her staff, like, y'all should get out of the house today. It is beautiful. There is a market down the street, and I think there's, like, a fair going on. Y'all go check out the fair. Y'all deserve a day off. Just go. And they're like, do you want to come? And she's like, no. And one of her staff was like, you know, I'd rather stay home with you. Like, if I'm having the day off, I'd rather, you know, just, like, get some sleep or something like that. Amy was just like, no. Mm -mm. And she even tried to, like, get the next door neighbor, the the widow next door, to go as well. And that woman was like, no, you have no jurisdiction here. I'm, I'm not going to the fair with, your, with your, your staff. And she was like, fair enough. But no, she insisted. The staff had to get out of the house. Like, she wanted some alone time. So after her staff left mid-morning, they returned mid-afternoon, and poor baby Amy was found dead at the bottom of the staircase at Cumnor Hall. Y'all, there are countless numbers of documentaries, YouTube videos, blog posts, uh, podcast episodes about the mystery of Amy Dudley's death. The big three contenders of what happened to her is one, suicide, or assisted suicide. Two, murder, because it does seem like there are some injuries to her that like she couldn't have done to herself necessarily like a trauma to the back of her head maybe which is another reason some people think maybe assisted suicide or three just an accident that she just fell down the stairs and broke her neck or something like that and honestly i like i said i don't want to spend a whole lot of time on her death because everyone talks about her death and no one talks about her life so i i'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this but i will give my my opinion, based on me just being an idiot with the internet, if y'all don't believe with my my opinion, that is totally fine. I would love to hear why you think otherwise. 
But I personally think that she did take her own life. Um, and like maybe assisted by somebody, maybe she had help. And that's why she was rushing the staff out because the person that was going to help her was on their way over. I think she was depressed. I think she probably, you know, she, she was sick and that didn't help anything in her mental state. I think she was working towards, she had nothing to work towards. Like what, what was her life going to be now? People just talking about her waiting for her to die anyway. What if that stretches out? I don't think any, if you are having suicidal thoughts, please get the help you need. Like, but I just think that this woman is what, what she was going through was too much for her to handle. And that is my two cents. What we do, we'll never know about how she died, but what we do know about her is she was an educated woman who got a rare opportunity of the time for her class to marry for love. Some of her life seems to be happy. She was raised by parents who loved her and took the time to educate her, who housed her when she was in need and who left her their inheritance in a time when they could have found a male relative to leave it to. So that leads me to believe that she had a happy childhood with loving parents. Her family was comfortable, but they didn't live in the fear of the chopping block of the Tudor court, like the inner circle of the nobility did. And she was generally liked by everyone that knew her. But then her life took a turn. Her husband was tried and convicted of treason and sentenced to death. And then both of her parents died, like bam, bam, quick succession. And I think the stress of what happened, what she went through with her husband and then both of her parents passing all in like a two, two to three year window like that probably fucked with her, fucked with her mentally, fucked with her mental health. And also she got very sick. So that is the life of Amy Dudley. I... I, like I said, I think that she is a victim to the Tudor court just as much as other people are, just in a completely different turn of events. And I think she's fascinating. And if there are any other stories in her life that I've missed, please share with me in the comments or on our social media post or something, because I just really, I would really love to know more about this fascinating woman. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and I will talk to y'all soon. Cheers, bitches.